Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another episode of the Double Digit Hockey Show. I'm excited for this one today. i got a great guest lined up for today. Of course, we are here on ASTVProductions.com. And don't forget, you can catch the show if you miss any part of it tomorrow on my YouTube page, Double Digit Hockey on YouTube there. Um, August is normally the hockey dead month of the calendar year. This year is no different, but yet... We're going to find something to talk about and to help me with that today. I have a great guest. He is the play-by-play voice of the Drumheller Dragons of the AJHL. Addy James joins me. Thanks for your time today, bud. How are you? I'm doing great, man. This is uh, this has been a long time in the making. Yes. And I'm glad that we're able to finally get it done. But I'm doing well, and I uh, I appreciate you having me on. A little shame that I got your co-host on your sh- on your podcast on before you, but uh, we'll see if you can outdo him here. We got oh, lots. I'll, I'll, I'll do my absolute best. Don't you worry. <laughs> we got lots to get into today, despite the fact that there is actually no hockey. But before we get into that, what's keeping you busy during this off season? What do you got going on right now as you pre- prepare for a new season coming up? Ah, uh, yeah, no, it's like you said, man. It's been. Um... It's been silly season in the NHL, so it's been keeping yep. up with that. There's a lot of a lot of little things going on. We had a lot of stuff to talk about in the last few weeks. Um, but as for time passing, just just trying to keep up on the YouTube channel, trying to keep up on Twitter. Holy moly, everything yeah, no uh, everything and anything is going on on Twitter these days. Um, and I actually just got my schedule from the Dragons yesterday, so we were just working out which games I will be doing. So it looks like I'll probably only miss a few. Um, but yeah, no, it was good. Just uh, just getting ready for the next AJ season, um, getting my getting my broadcast voice ready and good to go. <laughs> and uh, no, other than that, it's it's been pretty smooth sailing this summer. That's awesome, awesome to hear. Uh, before we get into the AJ talk, I see the Blue Jays hat. I see the tweets online. A lot of Blue Jay love on the on the Twitter sphere. There, what have you made of the season so far of the Blue Jays? And then I got to get your take. Is it Vladdy for the MVP, or are we talking Otani? Oh man, so the season has been, it's been good. I've been a Blue Jays fan for a very, very long time. Not many people know this about me, but I would almost consider myself a bigger baseball guy than I am a hockey guy. Um, Played a pretty high level in Ontario growing up and uh, it's always been in my blood. But yeah, the Blue Jays are a team to watch this year. You want to talk about uh, a a deep team. Um, You know, we, we started the year without Springer and there was a lot of question on, do we even need this guy? And then he comes in and he, and he picks up like, like nothing ever, like he never missed a beat. Right. So it's, um, it's a fun time to be a Blue Jays fan. It's a fun time to be a baseball fan in Canada. There's a lot of good reasons to be watching the Blue Jays right now. Um, I like the additions at the deadline. Pitching was definitely a a, a must. Uh, Barrios has been fantastic. Uh, Simba has been unreal. Um, It's been fun. It's been a really fun season. And I don't want to say that I'm seeing flashes of 2015, 2016, but um, it sure would be nice if we had another. Yeah, no kidding. They're only two and a half games back. I think right now, I believe they're probably underway now in Anaheim as we speak. But uh, yeah, two and a half games back and looking at the rest of the schedule, there's some there's definitely some ground to be made up with some struggling teams. We've got uh, a good few chunk of games against uh, the Orioles we can uh, capitalize on. Um, and then big series against Tampa Bay, big series mm-hmm. against uh, the Yankees. Those will be make or break series as well as we chase those teams down. But no, definitely, uh, definitely excited to be a baseball fan right now. And as to as for your question about Otani or Guerrero, I as this is the most unbiased uh, answer ever. I really <laughs> wish I could say Guerrero, but it's tough not to go Otani. It's really tough. This guy's magical. Um, it's truly a gift as a baseball fan to be able to watch this guy do what he does. You know, they call him the modern day Babe Ruth for a reason. He's, uh, he's incredible on the mound. He puts up great numbers on the mound and his slash line at the plate. Uh, even aside from the amount of home runs he's hitting, he's a gift. And so with that, I will say, I think Otani's pretty much got the MVP under lock. I like the honesty. I don't always get that from the Toronto Blue Jay fans. Truth be known, I'm not a Blue Jays fan. Everyone who follows me on Twitter knows that. I don't cheer for the Blue Jays. I was going to trash talk a little bit, but then the Royals went in there and went over. And I remember that your Royals are. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And then they get blown out in the first series back at uh, in Toronto there. So I just kind of kept my mouth shut and uh, (laughs) cheer against them quietly now as as time goes on. But great series against the Angels there, the doubleheader yesterday. And it's, it's a great conversation between Otani and Guerrero Jr. We won't have that here because I'm sure the hockey fans are yelling at us right now on the podcast, but that's okay. Hey, that's what we do here on the show. We have a little bit of fun things before we get going into things. 
All right, AJHL, it's coming quick. It's coming fast. How excited are you for the new season and to be back behind the mic calling these Drumheller games? Oh, it's going to be awesome. It's, uh, you know, truthfully, I did, last year was my first year be uh, behind the mic um, with my lovely partner, Dustin Edwards, in the broadcast booth and drum, drum heller. Um, but it's I'm looking forward to my first season with fans in attendance. Uh, last year was mm-hmm. definitely, you know, we didn't get the same reaction out of those lovely cardboard cutouts that we had in the stands at the drum heller Memorial Arena. Um, but it's uh, it's definitely something to look forward to to be able to call mm-hmm. uh, call some live games with actual fans. Um, I find it, you know, m- maybe a little bit difficult as a broadcaster to kind of keep up with the tempo and try to make the game a little bit more engaging in the sense that you don't have fans there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe it was a bit of a struggle, but I think, you know, obviously what, uh, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So hopefully that uh, kind of made me better at the craft. But um, definitely looking forward to some great Drumheller hockey. We've got some players that graduated. Uh, they're going to go play in, uh, in the U.S. for school next year. Um, but there's lots to uh, lots to look forward to with this Dragons team. And it's going to be nice to see them play against the entire AJHL instead of yes. just the cohorts that they did last year. Um, we made it through two, co- two cohorts, uh, or one and a half, I guess we'll say, before the season was inevitably shut down due to a COVID outbreak um, in the cohort that we were about to go into. So it'll be nice to see other teams. It's going to be nice to see Black Falls as well. They're going to be coming mm-hmm. into the league this year. Um, some pretty nice jerseys. I know you're a jersey yeah, guy. We'll get into those for sure. We'll, we'll talk about that later. I don't want to yeah, jump absolutely. the gun, but uh, no, that's very, fine. Excited, very excited about that. Very excited to see some other teams as well. Uh, and looking forward to seeing some fans back at the Drumheller Memorial Arena. It's always hard to gauge expectations for these junior B, these junior A teams, junior B teams. What would be a fair expectations for the Dragons this year? They, I know they've had a little bit of success in the past. They're in a tough division with, we'll get into the, the two juggernauts in a little bit here as well. What's a fair expectation for these Drumheller Dragons this year for you? Um, you know what? They, they, uh, they, like I said, it was, it was hard to get a good judge of it last year just because of the cohorts. We mm-hmm. didn't see, it's very similar to the NHL, right? It's going to be a completely different looking NHL this year because yeah. the divisions are going back to normal. Um, so it was, again, an AJHL and an NHL season like any other, unlike any other last year. Um, but for the Dragons, you know, I'm expecting them to come out strong. There were some young guns last year who... We're playing in the bottom six that we're going to expect to take some bigger roles and bigger leaps this coming season. Like I said, with some players graduating, uh, going on to play in the NCAA next year. Um, so yeah, it's going to be nice to see some of these um, some of these kids take some bigger steps next season. Uh, you know, the Dragons. I would expect them to be a playoff team. The more uh, the more hockey, the better. Uh, mm-hmm. And obviously, behind them being behind the mic for a playoff game is something I'm going to want to be a part of. Uh, I, I would expect them to, to to fare pretty well, but I know we're going to talk about the juggernauts, and that's probably going to be the uh, the stopping force of the AJ this year. Well, let's get there because these two, they always seem to be there. But I want to start with an individual player, a guy who was drafted 25th overall in this past NHL draft to the Columbus Blue Jackets, a guy who's caught my eye, a guy who's getting that comparison to being maybe a McCarr light type of hockey player, Cole Coolmans. Is this his league to run this year for you? And how good can he be in your eyes? Yeah, honestly, this uh, the upside that this kid has is incredible. An absolute gift to watch. Uh, mm. And just a quick side note, you love seeing players from the AJHL and from these junior A leagues uh, in in across Canada uh, getting taken in the first round. 100%. And even, you know, it's, it's great to see. And I think it just speaks volumes to how under appreciate I mean maybe not underappreciated but maybe undervalued these leagues truly are as a development league you know we tend to think mm-hmm. about the USHL um and we talk about obviously the the CHL the dub this the O and the QMJHL in Canada um but mm-hmm. these junior teams they can produce some pretty good talents and if you know we take you back to mm-hmm. just some kid named Kale McCarr I think that tells you enough about <laughs> how good these leagues are and how how good the products can be but yeah I definitely think that this is uh, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with this year in the Alberta Junior Hockey League. He was a gift to watch last year, a gift to call last mm-hmm. year. Um, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing some more of him and maybe some more players take next steps in the 2022 entry draft as well. People always look at the AJHL and the WHL and then Saskatchewan and so forth as almost like competing leagues, but it's nice to see them not being competing leagues, but companion leagues and just developing these great young hockey players 
Kale McCarr and now Cole Coleman are very good results of that companionship and that partnership that these guys have. Breaking it just down to being player development rather than trying to be the better of the two leagues. I like that. Um, AGHL does not get enough love. You reported it perfectly there. Brooks Bandits always seem to find these guys. They have this unbelievable recruiting thing. Lots of money to do it with as well. They're probably the team to beat again. That goes without saying. But what are you expecting from Brooks? Are they as good as years past? Or maybe this is a bit of a down year that someone could catch them. You know what? I, I I never think you want to count this team out because the minute you start thinking that they're going to maybe take a step back, they shock the hell out of you. And all of a sudden they're one of the top teams in the league again. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't want to set my expectations too low for this team next year, just mm-hmm. for the sake of not looking silly. Um, I definitely <laughs> think that they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. They've never given us any kind of false hope to thinking that mm-hmm. they're going to be a team that's just going to be as, uh, as many people like to call it the free pass on the bingo card. Right. So there's there's no such thing as that in any league, I don't think, let alone uh, mm-hmm. let alone a team like that who's been so dominant for so long. Like I said, great team, great team to watch, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing kind of how dominant they truly can be because we never got to play Brooks last year, um, mm-hmm. so I never got to see them up close and personal, but um, definitely looking forward to seeing kind of the tempo and the pace and and how our Dragons can keep up. That's quite the uh, the system they have there, quite the organization they have there, and the model of consistency in the AJHL. But they're getting their run for their money now. Okotoks Oilers, they seem to be coming every year. This might be the year they could catch them. How good can Okotoks be? And is this as good of a roster as I think it can be to be able to take over the Bandits here? For sure, um, and, and I'll preface with this: as good as as good as we give credit to the Brooks Bandits, the AJHL is truly a league is an any team league. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's not a lot of teams that can, uh, you know, until the season starts and we start seeing how these teams play. There's really no definitive answer going into a season, right? We mm-hmm. we know Brooks is going to be good, but at the same time, we know Drumheller is going to be good. We know that uh, Grand Prairie is going to be good. We know all these teams are going to be good, right? All these mm-hmm. teams have what it takes to beat one another. That's why they play in this great uh, in this great league in Alberta. Um, mm-hmm. As for Okotoks, I truly think that they can take, uh, you know, they can take some steps forward. Uh, again, another team that unfortunately due to, the, due to the cohorts I didn't get to see last year, um, but a team that I'm very looking forward to seeing next year. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, maybe, maybe we'll have to do a follow-up sometime in the middle of the AJHL season where we can, uh, we can kind of take a deeper dive into it. Um, but looking forward into this season, I definitely think that Okotoks can be one of those teams that are top of the AGHL standings. I've had Gino DePali on my show. As you know, he's the play-by-play guy of the Okotoks Oilers. Yep. He swears this is the year, so we'll see how that works out. I'm going to have to get you both on later in the season. And, Not if uh, Drum has little... anything to do with it, I'll tell you that thing. I'll <laughs> tell you that for sure. <laughs> that leads me into my next, my next question. For me, this is a three-headed race in this division, and it's good to see that we're having, I don't want to say closing of the gap because there's not really a gap there, but it's nice to see that this isn't just handed to Brooks every year anymore, that these other teams are giving Brooks a run for their money. You have the Dragons there. You have the Oilers there to to try and and win this division, but they're not alone in this chase. We have a new chase, a new team in this chase, I should say. The Mustangs, unfortunately, had to move, didn't go away last year. They're now the Black Falls Bulldogs. You mentioned it. Probably, if they're not the best jerseys in junior hockey, they're dang close. They got a great new rink. How excited are you for the Bulldogs to join the AJHL? Um, well, I'll tell you one thing. If they're as electric as they are on Twitter and as interactive <laughs> as they are on Twitter, then this is going to be a team to watch in the AJHL this year. Um, but all jokes aside, I think that this is going to be um, – you know, a, a lot of teams are going to look at this and 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 kind of think of you know. I, I try to relate it to the uh, uh, the NHL as much as I can, mm-hmm. in the sense that Seattle's coming in here and they're going to uh, they're going to be the new kids on the block, and uh, Black Falls will be the same uh, in the AJHL. So I think a lot of teams will kind of have a play in a feeling out period with them, and uh, you know we'll see uh, we'll see how they fare out. But I'm looking forward to seeing those jerseys in action, man. Holy moly, are those things not gorgeous or what? They're they're the best. They're the that third jersey that they made as well. That the, oh, just oh. gorgeous, right? Like, how are you not going to get one of those and 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 have one? I just don't understand how you're not gonna go out and have all three of them. To be honest, oh, it's hard. Um, it's it's gonna take a dent in my wallet, but I think I'm gonna be <laughs> yeah, absolutely for, you know? worth it, right? That's Christmas <laughs> totally. for me, right there. Totally. <laughs> this team, 
is electric on social media, as you mentioned. They're electric in, in talking to the people that I've talked to in the organization. They've built a junior team from scratch here, a bunch of new players coming in. I don't know how I don't know if you know how hard that is, but for me, I, that's got to be a big task to undertake. And they've done that quite well. So I'm very excited to see the product that they can put on the ice. It is unfortunate the Mustangs left Calgary, but Calgary still does have the Canucks there. The Canucks mm-hmm. have had a bit of a hard time. They mm-hmm. rebranded recently. What are your expectations for the Canucks here? Have they finally found a little bit of ground to work with for you? You know, you'd like to think so. Because as much as, uh, you know, I, I cover the Dragons and and obviously I'm a little more, I try not to be biased towards them, but being employed by the team is definitely, uh, <laughs> you know, it, 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 you, you carry some biases around. Yeah, uh, I won't lie. But you, but I think the thing that you like to see the most, and especially in development leagues like this, are teams taking the next step. Because at yeah. the end of the day, you know, say what you want, you want to see these players take the next step. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I mentioned this before to you when we were talking about the Kale McCars uh, and players from the AJ going in the first round. We love to see products of Alberta, products of Saskatchewan, and products mm-hmm. of BC playing in this league, and we love to see them taking the next step, and we love to see them going inevitably into the NHL. So it's going to be, um, you know, I, I really hope that the Canucks take that next step for the sake of the players that, you know, maybe are draft eligible for next year, and even beyond that, even the players that are maybe just looking to get a mm-hmm. scholarship, stuff like that. We want to see these kids continue their hockey careers after the AJHL, whether that be professionally or academically. Uh, and who knows, even if they take the, uh, the the college route, there's always a path to the NHL from there as well. So um, I really do hope for the sake of the players that they do take that ne- that next step and they get the recogni- recognition excuse me, that they deserve. I like that rebranding they have there as well for oh, the Canucks. Reset it, clean. restart it, let's go, right? So It's clean. Correct me if I'm wrong here, but old sat out last year because of the COVID thing. They're back this year, if I'm not mistaken. Olds, olds did play last year. Did they play last year? They did, yes. Was it Camrose that sat out last year? There? Camrose also played last year. <laughs> did they? I, I yeah, swear it, one of them sat out, but they, I there, could be wrong. You know there. what? There there were some teams that did sit out. Uh, that was actually our first cohort. Was right. um with Drumheller, Olds, Camrose, and oh geez, it's slipping me who the the fourth team in the cohort was. Actually, no, I think they were three. Te- I can't remember. Last year's such a blur. It was such yeah, a chaotic year. You know, trying to follow the NHL and 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 keeping that's up. That's why with- I asked my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally fair. But yeah, Camrose and Olds were uh, they they were neck and neck with Drum last year too. They were there were some pretty good series uh, to come out of that cohort. Mm-hmm. Lots of uh, lots of goaltending battles. Um, and I'll say one thing about uh, about the Dragons last year, specifically against Camros, lots of penalty trouble on both sides. It seemed like uh, the the refs definitely had the wh- the whistles out, and both teams were playing uh, maybe not a sloppy brand of hockey, but definitely a chippier brand of hockey. Um, lots of stuff after the whistles, lots of uh, lots of you know words for each other, and that's the beauty thing about not having fans is you can hear every interaction <laughs> on the ice from up in the broadcast booth, and uh, some of the things these kids come up with when. Uh, when you're trying to listen to hear what the penalties, you know, you got one one uh, headphone off and you're trying to hear what the, you know, you're trying to call the game, but you're also trying to hear what's going on on the ice. Oh, man, <laughs> it was fun. But yeah, good series against both those teams uh, last year for drum. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about the North Division. We can't leave the North out of this. I know it's not your bread and butter because you're part of that South Division, but there was a good story in that North Division. And I hate COVID again for this reason, because... For McMurray came out of nowhere last year, and they had quite a start. They went 5-0, and then there was a shutdown. They came back. They were still strong, and then they unfortunately they couldn't compete because of COVID. Mm-hmm. Can they repeat that in this North Division for you, or are we back to the uh, Spruce Grove for Sherwood Park for the division lead here? You know what? You love to see teams like that, like we mentioned before. We love to see teams competing after or follow up a season like last year and uh inevitably have another great year so i for mm-hmm. one i'm going to be rooting for fort mac to do uh to do what they did last year but it, you're right they had they they had this almost swagger to them and they were scoring a mm-hmm. lot of goals really fast i remember doing out-of-town scoreboards at intermissions and uh seeing those fort mcmurray games and just thinking to myself holy moly if we ever have to play against these guys we better put down some put up some shutdown d yeah. and uh you know our, our net miners better be on their toes because this is a team that likes to score goals and they know how to score them in bunches. So they're definitely a force to be reckoned with. And I sure hope 
that for the sake of, like I said, we, we care about the players, right? This is something I care yeah, the most about these development absolutely. leagues are the players. So I hope for the players' sake that they get the uh, the same experience that they had last year and we see some more players graduate and go, you know, play some pro eventually uh, later on in their careers. I don't want to set this bar too high, but they looked like the bandits of the North for a while there last year. They did. Very unfortunate how their season ended. So I hope those kids, yeah. like you said, can come back and have a good season. We talk about Spruce Grove all the time and how good that they are. That is another outstanding Alberta program. Mm -hmm. What can we say about the Saints coming to this year? Are they back to being the favorites of this division for you, or are they in a rebuilding set in a kind of a rebuilding form for you? You know what? I think that it's safe to say that until proven otherwise, they'll probably be that team that we've come to expect um, in that North Division. Uh, a powerhouse, a dominant team, a force to be reckoned with, similar to how we see Brooks in, in our division, right? So mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I definitely think that they are going to be, um, until proven otherwise, like I said, and anything can happen in these leagues. And that's another reason why I love junior hockey so much. Yep is because you don't have those teams year after year like your Tampa. Like you can't compare. The thing is you can't really compare the AJ to the NHL or other pro leagues mm -hmm. because there's so much turnover. And it's not yep. because there's so many trades and all that, but it's just inevitably players grow out or uh, yep. they age out, right? And they go on and they continue their academic career. They go on and play pro, they go to Europe, they do whatever they do, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I like the most about junior is the fact that, you know, one team could be a powerhouse one year and then maybe another team has a couple good signings in the off season yep. and, uh, and they come out and they end up being a force to be reckoned with. So, um, to talk about the saints. Yes. Until proven otherwise, which I'll, I'm going to put a big asterisk beside, <laughs> uh, until proven otherwise, I think they will be a dominant factor in the North. Much like the bandits have the Oilers on their heels every season. Spruce Grove has Sherwood park more seasons than not nipping at their heels. What do you make of the crusaders going into the new season? You know, again, like I'm going to bring it back to the whole until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, when the when you have those teams that are always kind of knocking on the door, constantly on your heels, um, all it takes is a couple, you know, little moves, uh, whether it be in the off season or you know the, via trade, whatever they do. Uh, all it takes is a couple little moves, similar mm -hmm. to how it can change in the NHL, and uh, that can put you over the edge. So if that's something that uh, that they can do, then. You know, it's 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 hard to forecast it now, but it's definitely, a, you know, it's not outside of the realm of possibility. I'm interested to see where you go on this one, because I've asked this question to a few other people. The, who are you most excited for to going back to these seasons? For me, if it was the 20 year olds, those kids who are the overagers who have a chance to finish out their careers felt really bad for the last two age groups that had to age out of the junior leagues, whether it was Western Hockey League, AJHL, wherever they were playing. Who are you going to be most excited for to get back to a regular season in regular form and have a chance to finish? Was it, is it the overagers for you? Is it the new kids coming in? Is there specific players for you? Yeah, you know what? We had a few overagers last year who ended up inevitably getting um, some scholarships, which was great. Awesome. Uh, and that's something that I love to see, right? Uh, the guys that are possibly at the tail end of their junior careers who have that last effort to try to get something, you know, beyond the AJHL and beyond junior hockey, right? We talk mm -hmm. about scholarships. We talk about, you know, best case scenario, they have a fantastic standout year and they end up going in the NHL draft, right? Um, yeah. So I think it's al almost always going to be the overagers for me uh, just because it's kind of like they're, you know, they're, they're playing for a little more than, than just uh, just a championship, right? They're playing for some of them are you know want to want to go to school or maybe they don't you know they they their path may, may not be the NHL, so they want to take the school route. Um, and scholarships mean a lot, and there's a lot of scouts that go to these games and scout these kids mm -hmm. to uh, to NCAA schools. So um, I think it'll always be for me the overagers. I love watching these kids play. I love watching how much effort they play with how much heart. You can see it on the ice. You know, they yeah. they 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 kind of have that, uh, you know, obviously leadership because of their age, but mm -hmm. they're setting the example for the next wave of players to play through that organization, right? They're setting the standard for work ethic. They're st setting the standard for expectations uh, from the organization, and they're they're playing for their uh, for their hockey lives. So I think for me, it'll always be the overagers. Yeah, I love that too. There's 
a couple of good examples of that that are in the NHL now. Derek Ryan, for me, is a really good example yep. of that. A guy who played Western Hockey League in Spokane. He went through the college ranks. He went through a bunch of European leagues and finally got a crack with Carolina a few years ago, sticking with it. So it's guys like that that you like to root for, and that's why I root for these overagers. You don't get those stories a ton, but you do get them, and when they happen, you feel really good for these guys. Yeah, definitely. And it's it's nice to be able to see these kids play too, right? Uh, Absolutely. You know, being able to follow their careers from junior, you know, see them. And then, you know, maybe a few years down the road, you see them pop up on your screen because they got a secondary assist on a goal from the, uh, <laughs> from the fourth line, right? Oh, this guy ended up making it, right? And it's a good yeah. little redemption and feel-good story. Yeah, and those are the kind of guys you win with at the end of the day too, oh, I, totally. I fully believe. Mm-hmm. Going into the 21-22 season, open-ended question here, what is for you the biggest storyline for the Alberta Junior Hockey League? Um, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, COVID took out a lot of stuff from uh, junior hockey last year. Uh, even, you know, looking in Ontario, the OHL didn't even play last year. Yeah. Um, I think junior hockey as a whole, not just the AJHL, is going to have a big rebound 2021-2022 season Mm -hmm. in the sense that the majority of these leagues will be having fans. The AJ will be at full capacity. Uh, There will be fans in the building. I can confirm that. Not that it's any secrets or anything (laughs) like that or breaking news. I know we're talking (laughs) off off screen about uh, the bombs that I could possibly drop. That'll be it. That's as big of a bomb as we're going to get. Breaking news. going to have fans. Yeah. (laughs) Breaking, not so breaking. Um, but yeah, the fact that we're going to have fans in the building, you know, a lot of these players haven't, well, there's, you know, a good chunk of these players haven't played in front of fans like this before. Uh, so it's going to be great for them. It's going to be great for us in the booth. It's going to be great for the league as a whole, uh, generate some more revenue, get some more bums and seats. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there's a lot that comes with that too, right? Merchandise sales and and uh, food and beverage and all that stuff. So it's going to be great for the league in that sense. We're going to see a lot more personnel as well we're going to see more ushers we're going to see more concession people so it's going to be great to see you know everybody back uh beyond just the uh, media teams and the security and all that stuff so it's going to be great to see uh from a league-wide vantage point everybody coming together and appreciating some good junior hockey in this province I love it love it I'm glad we're back in the building I saw I know it's not the AJHL but the NHL today uh, the Flames are tweeting out about looking for their game day staff, and those kind of tweets get me really excited because that means we're oh. close, and that means we can get back in the building, and I can't wait for it. Definitely, man. I'm looking forward to it. All right, let's jump back a couple of weeks. Um, I'd love to get your reaction on some of the events we've seen over the last few weeks here, and let's start with the big event in the National Hockey League, and that was the expansion draft, the Seattle Kraken. They drafted a nice, well, an okay roster, I guess. They go out in free agency, but... What's your excitement level of having the Seattle Kraken join the National Hockey League? You know what? Uh, if I'm being brutally honest with you, about about the same as Vegas. Um, my excitement, my excitement, and my expectations are different, but my excitement is definitely there. Uh, I love seeing um, you know a band of uh, of players that were exposed going to new teams. I love seeing them come together mm-hmm. and kind of you know seeing the chemistry being built from the ground up. Uh, truly in a new, like in a brand new setting for everybody. Um, I think it's always great when we see another team come in, especially in a market that we think can be profitable, such as Seattle. I definitely think that's the market for it. Um, people had doubts about Vegas, but look at that. I mean, like yeah. that's probably one of the, arguably one of the best markets in the league right now. Um, so I'm definitely excited to see Seattle potentially become that as well. Um, and from a league standpoint, it's always great to have more competition, right? These guys are playing mm-hmm. for the same trophy that everybody else has been playing for uh, in years past, right? So it's going to be great to see the competition level up, especially in the Pacific Division. Um, it's going to make for some interesting hockey and some interesting rivalries, I think, for sure. Uh, and uh, I'm definitely just looking forward to seeing uh, a new team and a new set of beautiful jerseys on the ice. I'm going to always bring it back to jerseys because I know you're a jersey guy. I'm a jersey guy. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, the minute those things go on sale, I'm sure you and I are going to be putting a dent in our credit cards real soon. Uh, I already got... Uh... Two set aside. I'm gonna get the Flurry Brothers. I gotta get one of each. There get you a Flurry go. Brother on each. I'm a big WHL guy, so yep. uh, I've already got that all planned out. Uh, just have to convince the wallet to uh, say yes and uh, let me do it. So <laughs> that's the biggest part of the whole thing. That's the I'd big love- X factor for everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, this this mortgage seems to get in the way about once a month, oh, so we'll see how that. I, turns I know out how I know how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> 
Ron Francis took a lot of heat for the way that he went about the expansion draft, but he went about it with the fact that he wanted to arm himself as cap space, a new weapon in the National Hockey we've seen over the last few years here. Then he went out in free agency and he got himself a load of players, including Larson, uh, Alexiak, Grubauer, Schwartz, Wenberg, Johansson, Dunn, and more. What do you make overall of the job that Ron Francis has done for the Kraken as they get their set up here? Yeah, um, I definitely think that the expansion draft was a little bit different. I think that it was uh, um, unexpected, mm-hmm. I think we could say. There was a lot of picks that yep. you know, were a little bit of a head-scratcher from the casual fan, but I like to <laughs> trust what NHL GMs do because they're there for a reason. We can scrutinize and criticize yep. them as much as we want, but at the end of the day, they're the ones that are calling the shots and that have done this before. So obviously there's a calculated play with every move that every GM makes, unless your name's Ken Holland. Um, but uh, so, <laughs> we'll so it was, you know, <laughs> I figured we would. Um, but yeah, no, free agency was great. I think they capitalized on some negotiations, especially with the Grubauer signing. They capitalized on the fact that uh, maybe it was taking a little while there for them to come to an agreement with Colorado. And uh, Seattle swooped, swooped in and, and they were able to get the job done. And like you said, capitalizing on the biggest weapon in the NHL, which is cap space now. Um, A lot of casual fans and a lot of people don't realize how much of a weapon having cap space is. Look at what Arizona is doing, right? They're going to embrace the tank for a little while, take on some bad contracts, and they're going to, you know, reap the benefits in the sense that they're getting these picks and they're getting these young players that are they're they're going to in turn profit from in you know the next three to four years just for just for eating the salary of Jay Beagle and Louis Erickson for the next, like I'm pretty sure those guys have one year left on their deals anyway. So one it's year, yeah. really nothing to them. They got to get to the cap floor somehow. Um, they're going to weaponize with that. And I think Seattle is going to do the same thing. It's, uh, you know, I, I definitely think they've got some more moves up their sleeve. I don't think they have anything drastic planned. If I were to guess, I think they might just roll with what they've mm-hmm. got um, and then weaponize that cap space come the deadline. Um, you know, take on expiring deals from teams that are, probably trying to make, you know, they can, they can uh, broker a lot of these deals too. They can be the third people in to, uh, to, to, you know, take salaries on and reap the benefits mm-hmm. from two teams. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what else they do going forward. I don't think, like I said, I, I like, I'm not an insider or anything, but if I were to guess, I don't think that there's going to be many massive moves that we see in the next little while here. Um, but they're definitely going to weaponize that cap space. And I'm excited to see what they do when they do it. Me too. Uh, there's always a plan with Ron Francis, and we know that. His choice of coach also caught a lot of people off guard. I personally don't mind it. Coach Hackstall actually does a really good job at, at communicating with his players and getting the most out of these guys. Is he, for you, a good option for the Seattle Crack? And was he the best choice for you uh, going for Seattle? You know, I don't know if he was the best choice. He wouldn't have been my first choice. In fact, I was actually a little bit taken back mm-hmm. and, and shocked. Um, not to say I'm, I'm, I think he's a bad coach. He had a great career. Um, I, where did he coach in, uh, in the NCAA? North Dakota. North Dakota. That's right. Uh, so he had a great, he was a great coach in North Dakota. Uh, and then he inevitably came over to the NHL and, you know, maybe struggled a little bit. He wasn't a terrible coach by any stretch, got dismissed from Philly. Um, went and did some associate coaching with the Leafs. And, um, you know, now we see him behind the bench as the head coach of the Seattle Kraken. Sometimes I think too, like you talk about these players and getting a fresh start with a fresh franchise. I think the same could be said Mm -hmm. for coaches. So we can see maybe, uh, you know, a different and a new revitalized, uh, Dave Haxtell and, um, you know, maybe Ron Francis has something to do with that as well. A lot of it comes down to to the GM and the coach that, you know, they work hand in hand as a tandem. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, I think it's about finding the right fit with the GM as well. Uh, and I'm excited to see what he does. You know, like we saw what uh, Gerard Gallant did when he came into Vegas. Uh, we saw him packing mm-hmm. his bags from Florida and then uh, taking the next exit to the airport and stopping in Vegas. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens here. I'm excited to see kind of what his uh what his techniques and kind of how he how he'd like to you know deploy this team that was selected for him by his GM Ron Francis. One thing about Ron Francis is he's not shy to do things his way and I think that's what he's done with Seattle so far and I can't wait to see them on the ice and I can't wait to see that that they put on the ice there. Right across the border there they have a natural rival 
How important do you think that to play into the success to Seattle and vice versa to Vancouver? Yeah, no, that's uh, that, like when I said that we're going to see some new rivalries, I'm really excited to see not only Vancouver, but, you know, we're going to see a lot of them in the Pacific Division here. Uh, I'm excited to see what happens with them in Vancouver. We obviously we have that. Uh, mm-hmm. We do have that, you know, natural proximity of uh, of where they're located geographically. Yeah. Um and I'm excited to see kind of where that takes the the rivalry. Um, it's uh, it's definitely something to look forward to. We, you know, I would imagine that, you know, maybe some fans in Seattle were fans of the Canucks, and you know, <laughs> at the time. But now that Seattle's got their own team, uh, we're probably going to see some allegiances switched over. And uh, I'm I'm definitely excited to see kind of what energy the fans bring for both of those sets of home games because you're gonna you know you're gonna see some Canucks fans, uh, you know, granted that the mm-hmm. border is open for this, uh, you're gonna see Canucks fans in Seattle and vice versa just due to proximity and uh, and the fact that they're the newest team. I just wonder how big that invasion on each side of the border is going to be. I can't wait for it. Let's talk about Vancouver a little bit here. They go out and they make a big splash to get a lot of cap relief in the short term of bringing in Oliver Ekman Larson to the group. Where are you seeing Seattle or not Seattle, Vancouver this year in the Pacific Division? Have they taken a step forward for you? Or is this just recycling the problems that they've had for a few years here? They're such an interesting team. It's so intriguing to me to see mm-hmm. the moves that they make and not think that they're going to just basically redo what they did last year. Um, I don't think Oliver Ekman Larson is, and this is no, uh, like this is, this is no breaking news. He's definitely not the same defenseman that he once was, especially at that cap hit. Um, But I'm very, very intrigued because I feel like they can still pull it off. You know what I mean? Like they're one of those teams Mm that, 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 they could do it or they could just, they could, they, they, they could finish dead last like they did last year. Like it's, it's one or the other. There's no in between. It's not like we're going to see uh, a middle of the pack team. I feel like we're either going to see a dominant force in the Pacific division, or we're going to see them in the basement for the, for the duration of the season. I don't think there's really going to be an in between. I'd love to know what you think though. I uh, I think Vancouver could surprise a lot of people, but they're going to need one guy on that back end to have a little bit of a resurgence and be what they think he is and we've seen him be. And that's, for me, Hughes. Hughes, for me, mm-hmm. will drive this bus one way or another. You can talk all you want about their centermen, their wingers. They've got a good top six there. But if they don't get a good season out of that back end, who's chocked full of old veterans and one young kid here, I don't think they're going to go very many places. Quinn Hughes, for me, is the driving force of on this team, and I just wonder if we're going to see his return to form this year or if what we saw last year is more of the norm because we've seen both sides of it now from Quinn Hughes. Interesting. There's a lot on his plate now. He's, quote-unquote, the guy back there now with no more Edler as well, so mm-hmm. we'll see how he handles that situation because he still also needs a contract as well as Elias Pettersson. So there's a bit more work for Jim Benning to do here. The offer sheet thing's been thrown out there as well. I don't think we're going to see one. It would be fun for the chaos signs if that's where you like it for. And Mm -hmm. I do wonder about that uh, salary dump trade. In the short term, it's a great move for Vancouver because they get out from under a couple of contracts. That problem is going to resurface itself in a couple of years here with Oliver Ekman Larson. Vancouver's a very interesting team. As you said, they could be the class of the division or they could absolutely fall to the bottom of it. So be interesting. You can almost say the same. With either or. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't yeah, be surprised either. with either. <laughs> <laughs> you can almost say the same thing. A lot of people are giving this team pass before we even get to the season based on what we saw last year in the regular season. And that's the Edmonton Oilers. A lot of people are saying that this is the second best team in the Pacific division. For me, I'm saying show me because they made a lot of moves this off season on that back end. They got older and more expensive on the back end. That doesn't always necessarily mean you got better and you really didn't improve your forward depth, which was their Achilles heel in the playoffs last year. Interesting your thoughts on where you think the Oilers are going into 21-22 season. 
Yeah, it's funny to, you hit the nail on the head. A lot of people are already writing this Oilers team into being the second best team in the division behind the Vegas Golden Knights. And it's interesting to hear even, you know, the guys on the radio or even insiders and analysts talking about this team and thinking that they're going to finish second in this division. But like you said, you, 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 you put this perfectly in show me, right? They've done nothing so far to show us that they've taken the steps that they need to take in order to become a better team. You're going into next season with the same goaltending tandem. Uh, not to say mm-hmm. Mike Smith was bad this year, but father or last season, but father time will eventually catch up. As we all know, mm-hmm. father time remains undefeated. So, you yeah. know, is is this where we see Mike Smith take a step back and then they got to rely on Miko Koskinen, Stuart Skinner, right? We don't know what's going on there. Um, maybe we see Stuart Skinner. That would be a good nod to the WHL right there. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, like you said, too, they got older on the blue line. They didn't really address much in their uh, in their, you know, forward depth, which is something that they've constantly been riddled with was a lack of forward depth, you know, behind uh, Mm -hmm. McDavid and Dreisaitl and, you know, to an extent, Ryan Nugent Hopkins, which I like that deal. I like that deal a lot, actually, the Nugent Hopkins deal. Yeah, me too. What I don't like Mm -hmm. so much is the Darnell Nurse extension. Um, that's a bit of a head scratcher and, and we'll ask, uh, we'll ask the San Jose Sharks. It's a how big they feel number. About, uh, yeah, exactly. We'll ask the Sharks about how they feel about paying, um, paying big name defensemen like that. Uh, cough, cough, Eric Carlson, uh, $11 million to be the player <laughs> he is now. I know it's not the same contract, but Vlasic. Uh, the, you Vlasic, you got Vlasic, you got Carlson and you got, uh, Brent Burns all making a significant chunk of change. We actually talked about that, uh, a couple days ago on barn burner, but, um, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting because I think, the, like I said, you hit it on the head. It's going to be a show me year. Like, show me Ken Holland that you know I'm supposed to trust what you're doing. Uh, because as it stands right now, I don't even think Oilers fans are very happy with the moves <laughs> he's made and the money he's given out to certain players. Um, I like the Warren Fogel deal. I don't like it at the cost of Ethan Bear. Um, there's just a lot of head scratchers with this guy and this team. It's gonna they're gonna be a big question mark to me. I don't see them finishing second in the division, though. I'll tell you that much for free right now. <laughs> I do like the signing of Zach Hyman. We'll take the contract aside. I like that they added a player of that el- uh, caliber to that roster, but for me, it all comes back down to the depth on the back end i don't like any of their defensive moves i don't like the cc deal i don't like the jones trade i don't like keith at all on my back end i don't like anything they've done on the back end so show me this is going to be a bigger deal than they think it's going to be and i think they're going to miss adam larson and the aspect of the game that he brings to the edmonton oilers interesting show me i think we're both on the same All right, you have the jerseys hanging up. I have one hanging up behind me. Let's get to both of our bread and butter. The Flames and the fans, they were clamoring for change. They got a change they didn't expect in Mark Giordano being taken in the expansion draft. Nothing else big really has happened for the Flames. They did sign Blake Coleman. Where are you at with the current state of the Calgary Flames? So they definitely definitely made change. And that's something that Brad Living spoke about mm-hmm. in May on Locker Cleanout Day, is that there would be change. There has been change. We've seen some stuff uh, go on. Um, I'm confident in the GM because I think that he's fighting for his GM life right now. So I think he's going to be doing everything he possibly can to ensure that this is a successful playoff team going forward. Um, I like the Coleman signing. Again, similar to the similar to the Hyman one, we'll take the contract out in the later years. I think it's going to be a good a good signing in the first few, and then we could run into maybe run into some problems, but we'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. Um, we're jumping the gun a little bit <laughs> <laughs> and saying that it's going to be a completely bad deal for the entire duration. But um, yeah, I do like what they've done. Um, I like, you know, I I, I think I I will end up. I think a lot of fans will end up liking the Zadorov um, the Zadorov move because uh, he's you know. A lot of people, and you see a lot on Twitter. I know you see it because, you know, you call it out, I call it out. A lot of guys call it out when when people are just being silly, right? Uh, and a lot of yeah. people coming in talking about the Zadorov contract and saying that, um, you know, oh, he's not going to replace Giordano, which is not what he was brought in to do. He's a defensive 
Mm-hmm. I'm not going to say specialist, but that's that's the pretty much the only aspect of his game. He doesn't. He's not going to light up the score sheet, mm-hmm. um, but he is going to be a big shutdown body. You know, we talk about size and the intangibles. He's got it. Um, and I, I, I truly do think that we're going to grow to like this signing, you know, once they do settle uh, in arbitration. I agree with you there. This Flames group is going to have to defend as group and not as individuals to, to make up for the lack of a Mark Giordano. And that goes from his leadership of Chris Tanev down to what can you sell Valamaki do for this group? Let's go back to the Blumen signing as well. You mentioned that there, the last part of that deal is going to be ugly. Let's not let's call a spade a spade here. Mm-hmm. But that leadership he's going to bring in the first couple of seasons, I think, is going to be invaluable for the Flames up front and for those young kids. You've got to, you're thinking you have a Pelche coming, you have Zari coming, Dubé's breaking out here. You're going to need some good leadership around these kids. I love what Blake Coleman can bring to the Flames. I love that signing. I don't care how long of a signing it is. I, I like it. The mm-hmm. question will be for this Flames group, though, are they better than what they were last year, and can we see them get back into the Stanley Cup playoffs for you? I, You know what? I think that they can. I think that they will. Uh, there's a lot of talk about people saying that the Pacific is going to be a weaker division than what they were used to in the North. I don't, I don't necessarily buy that narrative, um, but I do think they're going to be competitive. Mm-hmm. I think that the Pacific is... You know, like I don't think of any one division now that we're back to normal division realignment that is, you know, necessarily better than the other or weaker than the other. They're all pro level, you know, divisions in in the best professional hockey league in the entire Mm -hmm. planet. So um, to say one's weaker than the other, I, I can't really get behind. But I do think they're a playoff team. I do think they got better in a way. And to to circle back to the Coleman signing. I think he's hungry. Mm-hmm. You know, he wants to be here. You see it on social media. You see it with him taking his family to Banff and going to the locker room and getting a jersey for, you know, his kids and stuff like that. He wants to be here. He's excited to be here. He wouldn't have signed mm-hmm. here if he didn't want to be here. Aside from maybe it was maybe it was the better offer than what he was offered, but uh, <laughs> that he does want to be here. At the end of the day, I, I truly do believe that he does want to be here. And I think that speaks volumes to a player's character. And to circle back to your comment about leadership, you know, these kids are going to be looking up to such a prominent, um, you know, well-grizzled playoff, um, successful mm-hmm. playoff player in uh, in Blake Coleman. And uh, he, was, he was a driving force on uh, both of those Stanley Cup teams in Tampa Bay. So he brings some pedigree in that regard. Um, I definitely hope that these younger players can learn a thing or two. And even, you know, some of these guys on the roster that aren't so young, some of the veterans could even learn a little bit from the player as well. So we'll see what happens, but I do like the signing and I definitely think the flames did get better and they still will get better because I don't think Brad is done. Um, I think we're going to see some more, uh, some more stuff down the pipe here. And I'm not talking about Eichel because I don't know what the likelihood (laughs) is of him, him even coming here. And I'm, you know, to be, if I'm being brutally honest with you, I'm getting real sick of saying his name and seeing his name everywhere. Uh, I put out a tweet and people lit me up for saying that I can't wait for Eichel to sign somewhere else so that the people I, in I Calgary can stop talking about it. <laughs> so like, it's, uh, you know, it's getting a little tiresome and, you know, the longer we wait, the more tired I grow of hearing his name, but I don't think that Brad is done. And uh, I, like I said, I'm confident in the GM. I agree with you there. I'm not going to go back to that name you just mentioned there. We'll skip right over that topic of conversation (laughs) for this show. Maybe another show because I don't want to talk about it. But I do believe the Flames aren't done. I do like what they have there. I do like they slot right now using a Peter Lombardius word. I'm very interested to see how how these guys respond to the adversity they had last year, to the coaching change they had last year. People are calling him Dinosaur Daryl Sutter. I think a full training camp is going to do him a lot of good for this organization, for this team. Expectations for you then. Let's put all three of these Canadian teams against one another. If you were to pick, who's the best? Who finishes the hot three teams for you? Well, I made the mistake of saying the Flames would last year, so I don't know if I want to do that just for the sole purpose (laughs) of of not being the jinx again this year. Um, You know, I... As much as I think the Oilers won't finish second in the division, any team that deploys Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl night in and night out 
is going to be a force to be reckoned with because those two are kind of good at the game of hockey. So we can't necessarily <laughs> write them out, write them off on any given night. Um, I think of the three, the Canucks are the worst. And then it, I, I truly think that it's a coin flip between Calgary and Edmonton. I don't think that you can definitively right now say one is better than the other, because I think that, I think that Calgary is becoming more and more complete you know, from, from mm -hmm. running four lines and three pairings and, and obviously goaltending, I think they're becoming more and more complete. Whereas Edmonton yep. does have two superstars in Dreisaitl and McDavid, but they're missing a lot of pieces otherwise because we're not sure what their goaltending tandem is going to be. Uh, we don't know what it's going to look like with father time and the fact that Koskinen hasn't been good at all. Um, and like we talked about just previously, the, the blue line is expensive, it's old, and it's unproven right now. So I'd say it's a coin flip. I do give the edge, I think, to the Flames a little bit, and that's not even being a homer. That's just like looking at it from an analytical side of things like you and I like to do. Uh, I do think I give the edge to the Flames just ever so slightly. Um, but I, I do think it could be a coin flip between either two. But I do definitely think that the Canucks are are, are at the bottom of the three Canadian teams in the Pacific. Now, here's where I throw the curveball at you. We spent a good chunk of time talking about these Canadian teams and about Seattle. We didn't mention Vegas for good reason because we think that they're probably going to finish first. There's three other teams in this division we don't have time to deep dive into today on mm -hmm. the show. If you had to put some money or any of those three California teams jumping up there into that playoff race for you, or are they still all just at the bottom for you? You know, it's hard not to think that the LA Kings are are one of those teams that could be competitive in California. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be San Jose. I don't think it's going to be San Jose nope. for a while. I think they're going to have to go through a little bit of a retool or a mini accelerated rebuild before they're um, competitive again. And the Ducks, I mean, the Ducks are the Ducks. They've, you know, we they've got the Flames number for some reason, mm -hmm. but uh um, I don't think that they're going to be competitive. I truly, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised, John, if we see uh, if we see the LA Kings make a push for a playoff spot. I love the signings that they made this season, I or this offseason. I love the deals they've given out. Um, I love the fact that we're going to see Cal Peterson in a more uh, in a more prominent role now. I love that we're going to see uh, some of these young guys coming up, and I think that. There's a lot of veterans on that team that these young folks can uh, can learn from. You know, Byfield learning from Anze Kopitar. He's Kopitar is pretty much training his replacement at this point. You know what I mean? Absolutely. He's. Uh, I think Byfield has the ceiling and the pedigree to even possibly be better than Kopitar was, or not was. He's obviously still playing, but when it comes time to look at the <laughs> careers sometime down the line, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's going to be tough. Uh, it's going to be a tough call to see who finished with the better career. It'll depend on how much hardware Byfield wins, but uh, honestly, I don't think I would. I would not be surprised to see the Kings. I would. I would even put money down on them squeaking into the playoffs. We are all quick to always just hand out these things before taking a little bit of a deep dive into it. I know we still have a month and a bit till the season kicks off, but I'm right there with you. Everyone's quick to give Vegas and Edmonton one two in this division, and they just default to the rest of this division. I wouldn't count out Los Angeles making a good push for it. I wouldn't count Seattle for not being in that conversation for what they've done as well. Right there with you. I love a lot of what the Kings have done this offseason. Uh, I love to bring that up and throw that curveball at people at the end of talking about what we talked about here and, and see if they can uh, back up their point. So that was well done by you and, and awesome. Addy, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, this has been great. I appreciate your time today. I want to give you a couple of minutes here to, to plug your new podcast. Just came out, episode two just dropped not too long ago. What is it? Where can we find it? We know it's with Mr. James Johnson we had on the show two weeks ago. Floor is yours, sir. What, tell us about your podcast. Yeah, so uh, we're part of the uh, Brevera Media Network now. We are a podcast with them called the Barn Burner Hockey Podcast. Uh, we are on Apple. We are on Spotify. Um, I'm not sure if, if we're uploading to YouTube or not yet, but I'm sure that's going to be in the works. But yeah, just a weekly show where we uh, kind of just uh, bounce ideas off one another. We talk about uh, the, the happenings of the week in the NHL. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, obviously similar to what you do, we're going to be bringing some guests on as well. We've got some stuff lined up uh, for next week and into the future as well. 
but uh, now that we've both been on yours, I think it's only fair that you come on ours. So I think we're going to have to do something there and set that up pretty soon <laughs> in the not Anytime. so distant future. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, the, you can find us on Twitter at uh, barn burner show. Um, you can follow myself and James. He's uh, at James Johnson, YYC and I'm at Audie James on Twitter. Um, and yeah, aside from that, just working on uh, stuff on my YouTube channel, which is again, just self-titled Audie James. Uh, lots of hockey stuff coming out. I got some stuff. I got a lot of editing to do. I got a lot of stuff down the pipe to <laughs> edit and get uploaded on there. And then, uh, like I said, again, just preparing for the upcoming AJHL season to be back in the booth for the Drumheller Dragon. So looking forward to a lot of stuff coming up here down the pipe. And uh, especially after looking at the schedule here and getting everything sorted out, it's it's making things more real for the uh, for my second season in the booth. So looking forward to that. If you haven't followed him on on YouTube, for some reason he decided he would like to take on the Buffalo Sabres rebuild and do that kind of <laughs> thing. There's a bunch of cool videos up there. So go ahead and check him out there and, and see that crazy project he has in a go. Addy, thank it's you tough. so much for joining me on the show today. Good luck. Okay, good luck on your calls this year with the Dragons. Look forward to getting you back and seeing how that season went for you guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And we'll uh yeah, we'll get you on our show sometime soon. And uh looking forward to talking to you again. Thanks, John. Absolutely. Thank you, Addy. And thank you, everyone, for joining me here on the Double Digit Hockey Show. This has been a great episode. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. And catch us every Thursday here on ASTVProductions.com. We'll see you guys next week. Have yourselves a good rest of your week.